Warren Buffett stepped out of his car and pulled his suitcase from the trunk. He walked through the chain-link gate onto the airport's tarmac, where a gleaming white Gulfstream 4 jet, the size of a regional commercial airliner and the largest private aircraft in the world in 1999, waited for him and his family. One of the pilots grabbed the suitcase from him to stow in the cargo hold. Every new pilot who flew with Buffett was shocked to see him carrying his own luggage from a car he drove himself. Now, as he climbed the boarding stairs, he said hello to the flight attendant, somebody new, and headed to a seat next to a window, which he would not glance out of at any time during the flight. His mood was buoyant. He had been anticipating this trip for weeks. His son Peter and daughter-in-law Jennifer his daughter Susan and her boyfriend, and two of his grandchildren, all settled into their own Café Olay leather club chairs, sat around the 45-foot-long cabin. They swiveled their seats away from the curved wall panels to give themselves more space as the flight attendant brought drinks from the galley, which was stocked with the family's favorite snacks and beverages. A pile of magazines lay nearby on the sofa. Vanity Fair, The New Yorker, Fortune, Yachting, the Rob Report, The Atlantic Monthly, The Economist, Vogue, Yoga Journal. She brought Buffett an armload of newspapers instead, along with a basket of potato chips and a cherry Coke that matched his red Nebraska sweater. He complimented her, chatted for a few minutes to ease her nervousness at flying for the first time with her boss, and told her that she could let the co-pilot know that they were ready to take off. Then he buried his head in a newspaper as the plane rolled down the runway and ascended to 40,000 feet. For the next two hours, six people hummed around him, watching videos, talking, and making phone calls, while the flight attendant set out linens and bud vases filled with orchids on the bird's-eye maple dining tables before returning to the galley to prepare lunch. Buffett never moved. He sat reading, hidden behind his newspapers, as if he were alone in his study at home. They were flying in a $30 million airborne palace called a fractional jet. As many as eight owners shared it, but it served as part of a fleet, so all the owners could fly at once if they wished. The pilots in the cockpit, the crew that maintained it, the schedulers who got it to the gate on six hours' notice, and the flight attendant who served their lunch all worked for net jets which belonged to Warren Buffett's company, Berkshire Hathaway. Sometime later, the G-4 crossed the Snake River Plain and approached the Sawtooth Mountains, a vast, cretaceous upheaval of dark and ancient granite mounds baking in the summer sun. It sailed through the bright, clear air into the Wood River Valley, descending to 8,000 feet, where it started to buck on the mountain wave of turbulence thrown into the sky by the brown foothills beneath. Buffett read on, unperturbed, as the plane rocked and his family jerked about in their seats. Brush dotted higher altitudes of a second ridge of hills, and rows of pines began their march up the ridges between ravines on the leeward side. The family grinned with anticipation. As the aircraft descended through the narrowing slot between the rising mountain peaks ahead, the midday sun cast the plane's lengthening shadow over the old mining town of Haley, Idaho. A few seconds later, the wheels touched down on the Freedman Memorial Airport runway. By the time the Buffets had bounded down the stairs onto the tarmac, squinting in the July sunshine, two SUVs had driven through the gate and pulled up alongside the jet, driven by men and women from Hertz. They all wore the company's gold and black shirts. Instead of Hertz, however, the logo said Allen and Company. The grandchildren bounced on their heels as the pilots unloaded the luggage, tennis rackets, and Buffett's red-and-white Coca-Cola golf bag into the SUVs. Then he and the others shook hands with the pilots, said goodbye to the flight attendant, and climbed into the SUVs. Bypassing Sun Valley Aviation, a pocket-sized trailer at the runway's southern end, they swung through the chain-link gate onto the road that led to the peaks beyond. About two minutes had elapsed since the plane's wheels first touched the runway. Right on schedule, eight minutes later, another jet followed theirs, headed to its own runway parking spot. 
Throughout the golden afternoon, jet after jet cruised into Idaho from the south and east, or swung around the peaks from the west and descended into Haley. Workhorse Cessna Citations, glamorous close-quartered Learjets, speedy Hawkers, luxurious Falcons, but mostly the awe-inspiring G-4s. As the afternoon waned, dozens of huge, gleaming white aircraft lined the runway like a shop window full of Tycoon's toys. The Buffets followed the trail blazed by earlier SUVs a few miles onward from the airport to the tiny town of Ketchum on the edge of the Sawtooth National Forest near the turnoff to the Elkhorn Pass. A few miles later, they rounded Dollar Mountain, where a green oasis appeared, nestled among the brown slopes. Here, amid the lacy pines and shimmering aspens, lay Sun Valley, the mountain's most fabled resort, where Ernest Hemingway began writing For Whom the Bell Tolls, where Olympic skiers and skaters had long made their second home.